Barry Harvey. Uh, I'm a professor of theology uh, in Waco, Texas at Baylor University. Been there for 27 years, but as I always tell people, I was a child scholar, so. Um, uh, and uh, have been a long time um, um, st student of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, stumbled into his theology in some ways more than uh, uh, other people. Um, but as I always tell people, um, I have a group of theologians, no matter what I'm working on, no matter what I'm teaching, they're, as it were, perched on my shoulder, uh, and, and they're whispering in my ear, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer is one of those theologians, so that even if I'm doing something completely unconnected with his work, his perspective, what I've learned from him so much, uh, is uh, constantly reverberating in my ear and through my thinking. Uh, and so that's, that's how I came to that. I'm the father of two and the grandfather of four and um, a devotee of college sports. And so that's probably a pretty good introduction right there. I came to Bonhoeffer studies indirectly through one of his friends at Union Seminary, a, a Presbyterian in the United States by the name of Paul Lehman. Um, but I got involved in professional meetings and somehow got drawn into the Bonhoeffer Society. And so over the past 25 years or so, I had written probably 10 or so articles or book chapters on Bonhoeffer. And I said, I would really like to write a full-length book treatment. Uh, out of the, uh, the uh, perspective I've always done, which is not just simply a historiographical research, but in a constructive vein, um, my big interest in Bonhoeffer is what he can teach us and what we can learn from him, not just in his own situation, but what he learned and did and suffered and failed at times, uh, is uh, very helpful to us. As I put it in the introduction to the book, while he cannot speak for us in our own time and situation, he has much to say and to teach us. Uh, and so that's the, the, the basic uh, rationale for that. Um, and I'm also able to expand on certain questions uh, that Bonhoeffer didn't directly address, but for me seemed to be uh, very much uh, a continuation of the trajectory that he himself started uh, in his life and in his theology. Well, I chose to write it around the theme of profound worldliness. This was a theme that runs throughout his theology from his doctoral dissertation at the tender age of 19 all the way up through his last writings from prison. And in particular, he mentions this idea of a profound this worldliness in a letter he wrote to his friend and uh, uh, the one who uh, collected these materials for us, Eberhard Betke, on the day after the failed assassination attempt of Adolf Hitler. So it, it's, it's of a particular moment. And he talks about becoming increasingly aware of the profound this-worldliness of Christianity, which he contrasts with what he calls the shallow and banal worldliness of consumerism and egoism. Um, and, uh, and, he's, and he adds, in, in addition, um, the importance of understanding that profound worldliness grows out of an understanding of crucifixion and resurrection. And it just seemed to me that was a message that needed to be heard for all kinds of reasons in our day and time, that th this was a theological theme uh, that uh, Christians and non-Christians who are interested in Bonhoeffer uh, needed to not only hear, but to contemplate and deliberate over. Uh, and so I took that, and then I added to it a theme that has not often been developed in Bonhoeffer studies, but which occurs quite often which is his critique of uh, technologies, not just in terms of instruments, like computers and the like, but even in terms of the way society is organized, um, around experts, around uh, certain engineering professions, for example, and, and capitalism, um, and expanded that to look at things such as racism as itself a, soci a social technology that, um, positions people uh, in relationship to one another and ranks them and values them. 
And I thought this was just a, a good way of, of spelling out, as I said, co continuing the trajectory that I think he started in his own lifetime, in his, not only in his thought, but in his life as well. And then I connected it up with some ideas that he has on the importance of the Old Testament. Um, and I connected that with some uh, recent reflections on the fact that, that Christians are, in fact, the ones who have been welcomed into a larger story of God, the Jew, of the Jewish people, um, and also to his profound love of music. Uh, I was trained as a musician. I make no claims to be a musician, but I was trained in music. And so he uses musical imagery a lot. And one image in particular that he uses that I thought was and still has tremendous potential, um, he calls it the polyphony of life. And again, it comes in a series of letters to his friend Betka about how our lives need what in music is called a cantus firmus. That is a, a, a theme, a melody that runs throughout. And then other themes of life, uh, earthly love, politics and the like, are juxtaposed to it in what musicians call a counterpoint. Um, if you know jazz music or you know Bach, you know what counterpoint is. All how these different voices can be singing something or playing something different, and yet they still harmonize. And I said, that, that's a picture of the church, particularly in a post-Christian, post-Christendom era, uh, in which uh, the privileges that the church has known in the past are no longer with us. And then finally, in the last chapter, um, I wanted to address the question of his participation in... Uh, the conspiracy against Hitler. Um, uh, one of the things that historians of that period tell us is it was not just the case that the um, uh, conspiracy failed, but it made matters worse and may well have prolonged the war. So the question is, what do we do with Bonhoeffer's legacy in that regard? And one of the things, like I said, this is where a failure of his can teach us. And it's not just a failure of his, but a failure of the church in Germany as a whole, that the church had not maintained and, and cultivated a legacy that there is a real difference between being a Christian and being, the mem uh, being a citizen in a certain nation state, as in Germany. Um, Bonhoeffer writes at several points that Luther wanted uh, a Christen Christianity that was spread to all people, but ultimately uh, he was unable to distinguish, and his theological tradition was un unable to distinguish being a good German and a good Christian. Uh, and I counterpose that to the story of a uh, church in France, a Huguenot or Huguenot church. Uh, the Huguenots were very much persecuted in France. And there was a little church in southeast France that maintained that identity. And uh, without firing a shot, with some arrested, a few died, they saved thousands of, thousands of refugee lives, um, mostly Jewish lives. And so I said, what, what accounts for that difference? And in part the difference is these French Protestants had been for centuries just doing the Christian thing, but at the ma same time maintaining their identity as Christian, and that that trumped being French in their context. And that was something I think Bonhoeffer was trying to recreate, but you couldn't recreate it in just a few years. Um, and uh, that's a warning to us in terms of maintaining an identity uh, and a, a mode of operating and a mode of behaving in the world that is distinct from uh, the rest of the world. This concept of, of worldliness uh, that is central to Bonhoeffer's thought is connected to another idea that he thought was important uh, and which has mystified a lot of people since he, uh, it came out in the 50s, and this idea of a religionless Christianity and a non-religious interpretation of the Bible. And for Bonhoeffer, religion had come to signify a couple of things. One, uh, an otherworldliness uh, after death, far away from this life. Uh, and he said, no, uh, the church belongs in the center of the village, not on the periphery. And another thing was, in addition to otherworldliness, is the idea of partiality, that being a Christian related to just a very small and private area of one's life. And he said, no, 
whatever else the church has to do, it has to bear witness to the claim of Jesus Christ on the whole of life. Right? And so by profound worldliness, that's the element to live fully in the world um, according to its basic reality, which for him, um, he was very specific. Uh, there are some interpreters of Bonhoeffer who would uh, like us to believe that he affirmed what's later called Christian realism, uh, most well-known as associated with Reinhold Niebuhr. But for Bonhoeffer, he was very clear. For him, reality was defined by the uniting of the divine and human natures in Christ. That defines what the real is. Uh, and so that's what the whole of life needs to come out for him. And therefore, this idea of worldliness stands over other kinds of worldliness um, that he thinks ultimately uh, miss the significance of what we were created for. And now, in particular, what we must now bear witness to, live and even die for, as he himself was a martyr uh, to uh, this plight of people other than himself. Um, most people do know, and if they don't, uh, it, it's an important matter to understand, that he had the opportunity to escape Germany just before the beginning of the war. And he decided he could not go back uh, and help uh, rebuild the church after the war if he didn't go through it with the German people. And so uh, that's another aspect of worldliness, and that is sitting where other people sit and suffering through where other people have suffered. And um, as we all know, he paid with his life being executed just a few weeks before the end of the war. There is this idea in, in, in his ethics uh, that Jesus Christ, who was sinless, became one of us in our guilty state. Um, and uh, we, as, as his followers, also cannot seek to escape participation in a guilty world. There's no fleeing away. There's no preserving one's innocence. That indeed, if you try to preserve your innocence from human guilt, you become even more guilty. Um, he talks about the fact that, that in the middle of this life, we don't know precisely what's to be done. We do the best, we weigh what are the options, we consider uh, success and failure, and all these things are important. But ultimately, we have to decide what we want to do, and then tr trust God will do the good from it. And if it involves our guilt, um, then we have to throw ourselves upon God's grace. Now, I think it's important to understand that for him, he felt himself in such a desperate situation with the uh, Nazis and with the evident persecution of people going on with the suffering of the German people. Uh, he was in prison for most of his time on the outskirts of Berlin. And while very few bombs came close to the prison, he could hear every night the bombers coming over and recognize the terrible devastation that was being wrought upon the German people by and large. And so when he took action by joining the, the conspiracy, um, he realized, as, as he said several times, we cannot make our primary um, object of our action to avoid guilt, that we have to take on whatever guilt there is by being in the middle of the human village with everyone else. One of the themes in Bonhoeffer's prison writings that have captivated uh, uh, people is this idea of, of living in a world without God. He, uh, one of his most famous and enig enigmatic phrases was, uh, we have to live without God before God. It's interesting, this is actually a theme that he had raised before uh, in his book, Creation and Fall, in which he talks about the fact that after the fall, human beings no longer received life as a gift that instead they were commanded to live by God. Um, um, and that's out of their own resources. And that's precisely what they could not do, is to live without God and without the resources of God. And so death becomes then that which dominates human life. And so he comes back to that theme in his prison correspondence. Um, and he makes the point that, that we, just like Christ, must live in this life um, without the gift of life. Um, 
my little paraphrase of Bonhoeffer coming out of creation and fall, but also from letters and papers, is that God says to the human creature who thinks they can be like God, uh, so you want to be gods? Fine. <laughs> be gods. Let's see how well you do. And we don't do it very well. And Christians are called into the live in that world precisely in that same st state. Um, and that means living as Christ had to live in the world, uh, in the midst of a fallen, uh, death-ruled world. And it's there that we bear witness to life, but it's life that comes through, as I've already indicated, crucifixion as well as resurrection. Um, and that's why Bonhoeffer said, yes, we look forward to the world to come, but we must first drink to the dregs this life. And we do it not just for ourselves, but for the world to which we bear witness. He has an understanding that, that technology has taken on a new um, emphasis and perspective in the modern world. That at one time, our crafts, our arts, uh, our equipment and instruments served a larger purpose of life. But now they quite literally take over our life and determine what are the ends that we will seek. And we constantly turn to them to try to find what is the good life, what our, the end of our life is. Um, and he mentions in a sermon, uh, which he preached just a few months before the accession of Hitler to the chancellorship in Germany, that um, we look to the latest scientific innovation. We look to the latest uh, market fluctuation. We look to experts all over for our salvation. And it doesn't come, but we still look to them. Surely they must have the answer. Surely they must have the answer. Um, and yet what that does, and this is now how he puts it in one of his prison letters, they continually throw us back on ourselves. And again, that's the image that comes out of creation and fall. Uh, God throws us back on, upon our own resources, um, which are wholly in, inadequate for that purpose. Um, and so uh, when I point to the importance of s these social technologies, of religion, of culture, of race, the idea that, that somehow these will create the conditions of life where we can truly stand on our own. Um, and... Uh, Time and time again, he points out, they fail us, and yet we continue to look to them as well. Rather than, and this is another important emphasis that I make with Bonhoeffer, the importance of participating in the messianic suffering of God in Christ. That, in fact, the only way life comes to us is precisely through death, through crucifixion, as well as the hope of resurrection. And that that's what Christians are called to do, even in the midst of a world that is um, inebriated by uh, this kind of uh, belief that somehow technology will solve our problems, organizing people in a certain way, using psychological or sociological methodologies to uh, chart exactly where human beings need to be. Um, and uh, he just anticipates, indeed, a lot of late 20th century uh, studies in which show we can't do that. That's Human life is always escaping uh, our ability to think we can master it and control it and make it come, come out right. That's absolutely true. I don't know of a, uh, another figure from 20th century theology in particular who has the staying power that he does. And it, generation after generation, he keeps captivating people's attention. And that is a fascinating um, fact that, that I've puzzled over. Um, I think part of it is um, his own life, which was not simply that of an academic, but also of one who, because of the circumstances in which he found himself, um, developed an understanding and a witness to his theology and to his belief uh, that tied together uh, what at one point he refers to as the phraseological and the real. This comes out of a letter uh, from prison in which he said that after coming back from New York, he moved from the phraseological to the real. 
uh, it's important to understand that while he was in New York studying at Union Seminary, he decided he would go to church, not in one of the big Protestant churches, Riverside Church, for example, which is right next door to Union Seminary. He went to Harlem, to the Abyssinian Baptist Church. And it was there, and he, by the way, he taught the sixth grade boys Sunday school class. Anyone who's taught sixth grade boys knows what an adventure that is. Um, that he began awakened to his own German context and what was going on there. And so when he returns, he said, I moved from the phraseological, from the academic, from the intellectual, which had pretty much uh, shaped him prior to going to New York as a, as a young theologian. This was really interesting stuff intellectually that he was studying and writing about. But when he came back, he discovered this deals with real people and real problems and uh, real controversies and challenges facing Christians. So he says, I start taking church seriously, praying seriously, reading scripture. Um, while in, in, uh, in New York, he met a Frenchman by the name of Jean Lesser. Um, you have to understand that in 1930, when he met Lesser, the World War I had only been over about a dozen years. And the French and the Germans just couldn't stand each other by and large. And yet it was from Lesser that he decided in a very unluther like way that the Sermon of the Mount meant what Jesus said it did and that the way of nonviolent uh, peace ethic was the way to go. Um, and again, that's not the, it was never the dominant opinion in Germany before the war. Um, and I just think, and then you combine with it his own efforts um, uh, trying in, in a seminary, uh, an illegal seminary, to cultivate Christians in this view of the understanding of Scripture and of Christ, of the peace ethic. And then once the war started, um, his own involvement in the conspiracy just continues to, to attract people and to, to realize that here in the struggles, both intellectual and practical, of this one man, there's something of what it means to be a Christian in the modern world is being pointed to. You may not always be the same thing, and people, when they read him, can read him in very different ways. But this is someone who, who, um, who as I have described it, uh, needs to be sitting on our shoulder, so to speak, as we reflect on our own challenges uh, to Christian faith and to worldly witness in our own times. Uh, so I think it's that combination of the, again, to use the, his phrase, the phraseological and the real. In the last chapter uh, to my book, I deal with a figure uh, as a comparison to Bonhoeffer, and it really sheds light, I think, on this importance of this idea of profound worldliness for Bonhoeffer and for us. Um, in the little French Protestant church, the pastor's name was André Trachme. Um, his mother was German, interestingly enough, and he became a pacifist uh, as a result of, of learning from a German soldier during First World War, First World War which, which, which is really interesting. Um, uh, Bon, the German Bonhoeffer learned his pacifism from a Frenchman, and this Frenchman learned his pacifism from a German. And that's, that's fascinating there. And so uh, Trachme had a really interesting way of thinking about it. He said, um, most people look at the world with a kind of univision, looking out of one eye, and saw, saw only what is. He says, when you have vision from both eyes, you see both how the world is and how the world is create, was created and is meant to be. And that you look at the world in both ways. And, and in some ways, it's another world, and yet it's this same world as well. That, in fact, the undercurrent of reality is not what we think as good Westerners and, and 21st century people. It's not markets and nation states and violence. It is instead the beginning and end of the world is the incarnation of God's Son um, and of that involvement, that intercession on the part of Christ into the midst of a world that thinks that violence and markets and trading and buying and hating um, is what makes up reality. 
And so that's why I, I, I think the, the idea of profound worldliness is so important, that it's at the heart of the gospel, that in fact, we are called to be the church, not just for our own sake, but for the sake that this continuing witness of God in Christ continues on in our own life. In the center part of the book, I argue that there are basically, there are more than this, but there are three social technologies that seek to put people or ideas or practices in a certain location, giving to them what I call their proper place, which means they're supervised there and they don't interfere with other things. Religion was one of them, and that comes directly out of Bonhoeffer's own understanding. Uh, he touches upon race, um, uh, he doesn't develop nearly extensively as he does with the concept of religion, uh, but I pick up on that and use some uh, contemporary black theology to unpack that for our, for our day and time. This third idea that I critique is that idea of culture. Um, it's one of the most fascinating studies to do in the English language is to look at what happens when the idea of culture develops. Uh, it's a relatively recent word in English, only about 500 years old. I know for Americans that's very old, but for the rest of the world it's not. Um, and increasingly, culture becomes this specialized realm um, that in some ways is set apart from so that it can't interfere with what we think is really important, which is things like market and governments and power. Um, and to, for me, that's best illustrated by Time Magazine. In virtually every issue uh, of Time Magazine, they have a special section called Culture, in which they talk about music and art, and dance. In other words, things that aren't really important because they're individual, people get to pick and choose, we entertain ourselves with culture. Um, and, uh, but we don't allow it to interfere, that, that something that we might learn from music. Uh, for example, uh, Bonhoeffer fell in love with Afro-American uh, spirituals while at Abyssinian, and he took them back to Germany. He says, now these people understand what music is and how it connects up with real life. But see, we, we segregate those kinds of things off, and we put it in its own little special realm called culture. And we say, you're perfectly free there, to do whatever you want, because it really doesn't matter for the huge public areas of life. Um, and so, um, and one of the things that happens is oftentimes the church gets sequestered into that realm of culture. Um, now, it's a word that we probably can't do without, because in, in some ways, it ref it's, that's why it's such an ambiguous word, this idea of culture. It can refer to the mores, the ethos, uh, the material products of a, of a people, and that's well, well and good. Um, uh, and so when I talk to people about this idea of culture, I say, uh, you can understand what's problematic uh, if you think about church and culture in one of three ways. The, the fact that the church has a culture, yes, like every group of people, like every uh, identity, we have a culture, we have an ethos, we have a material uh, a set of, of uh, products that we use. But then we say, but the church um, yeah, is a culture. Now we're starting to get a little bit problematic because now to say that the church is a culture is starting to move it towards the periphery and put it in its own little corner. Just like in Time Magazine, culture is put in its own separate section away from the world, the nation, you know, medicine, the, you know, the important things, right? Um, so when you say that the church is a culture, you already are starting to say, okay, it's a culture, like being Greek is culture, or being um, uh, a devant of, of jazz music, or, 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 or something like that. And, 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 so, and then when you say church is a part of culture, you've completed the sequestration, right? It now is tucked away in the corner where it's safe. That is, it doesn't interfere with anything. And that's the most unchristlike place for the church to be, separated apart from the rest of life, the whole of life, the center of the village. And so um, that's why, uh, and it's, it has an interesting career in, in colonial studies too.
um, uh, both uh, in other countries and here in, in the United States. To, uh, as soon as your way of life becomes a culture, you know it's already been uh, subjected and domesticated and put in a museum. So that now when we sample other people's culture, we go to weekend festivals and eat their food and see their dress. But beyond that, they're not much different than anyone else. Culture and race are closely related ideas, both in Germany uh, in the 1930s and 40s when Bonhoeffer was doing most of his activity and in our own day and time. Um, uh, it's really interesting. Um, some of the leading uh, sociology experts in the United States who study churches and study the divide between black and white churches, one of the things they say is they have completely separate cultures. In other words, uh, ways of doing things and, and, and uh, interacting. Uh, and neither is willing to give up on it for some legitimate reasons. And so um, there's that connection. In Germany, race had a somewhat different orientation. It wasn't tied to skin color as it usually is in North America. Um, for them, culture wa uh, was cl more closely tied to national identity. Um, and so there had long been the recognition of a, in what is, in Germany is called Kulturkampf, a culture struggle, for what does it mean to really be German? And of course, the prime example of those people in Germany who were not German were Jewish. Though it could extend to uh, skin color, um, Germany, one of the things it wanted as it moved into the 20th century uh, was its own colonies. And it took over some uh, colonies in Africa. And so they were quite willing and able to extend uh, this idea of, of race uh, and peoplehood. The German word is folk. Uh, folk. And uh, it, um, uh, obviously, whoever was not part of the, the German people was seen as excluded. There was also this notion in Germany of what was called culture Protestantism, Kultur Protestantismus. Um, uh, that basically tried to show that uh, what is most basic is a German identity rooted in a historic um, tradition, and that Christianity was seen as a way of feeding into that and uh, teaching it and reinforcing it. Um, now, the, it, it took a really um, uh, dangerous curve when it came to a group called the German Christians, who emerged in the 1930s, who wanted all the Protestant churches in Germany unified under this idea of the German people. And they went so far as to say, there is for us two sources of revelation. There is the revelation of God in Christ, and his life is witnessed to in the New Testament. And then there is the Old Testament, which for us German Christians is an example of how God educates a people, which means we have our own way of being educated by God, and it takes form in the, in the national socialist state and in the Fuhrer Adolf Hitler. Okay. And so this idea that there is a, a convergence, a commensurability between um, the church and the, whatever so surrounding society one's apart is one of the most, I think, profound problems that it wasn't just in Germany, it's in our country as well. Um, uh, all, if you ever were a Boy Scout, you heard the whole phrase, God and country. Um, and in a certain sense, it doesn't matter what comes after the and, it's a problem for Christians. Uh, uh, the Germans who resisted the German Christians, the Christians in Germany who resisted the German Christians, said, no, we have one word from God, Jesus Christ, whom we have to obey, believe in, in life and in death. And so that's one of the reasons I, I, I point out this idea. We have to be very careful with this idea of culture, because if we start seeing ourselves as somehow um, our primary responsibility as uh, enhancing culture, identifying with culture, supporting culture as it has come to be understood in the United States, 
then we miss the gospel. And we miss having that critical edge that when the tension between being a Christian and being a good American, a good member of Western civilization, becomes conflictual, we won't be like most Germans, Christians in Germany um, and fail to re recognize that the claim of Jesus Christ over the whole world always takes precedence. Polyphony of life is a concept that I uh, pick up and develop in the book from Bonhoeffer. And I actually take it further than he does. But again, um, one of the things that uh, I maintain in the book is uh, it's important to understand that Bonhoeffer uh, can speak to us about our own time, but that we have to, in ways, enhance, alter, correct, uh, uh, augment. And, and the polyphony of life is precisely one of those places where he makes a great beginning and we can take it further. He introduces the concept of polyphony of life in response to a letter from his good friend Eberhard Betka, who at the time was serving in the German army down in Italy. And his friend confessed to him, it's important to understand his friend was a, um, a student of his at the illegal seminary in the 30s. And they were very good friends. He became the conservator of Bonhoeffer's estate, for example, uh, and wrote the definitive biography, all these kinds of things. Um, uh, but he was drafted into the German army, was serving in Italy. And he confesses to his friend Dietrich that the fervor he had had for the church and for evangelism um, as a student had waned in the meantime and serving with the army in Italy, about the only thing he could think of was of his wife and son, newborn son. And then he tells an episode in which he and two of his uh, army comrades got together talking about things and sharing a bottle of Italian wine. And, and one of them said to the other, you know, we have to remain hopeful for the future because if we don't, we'll just hunker down and fight to the last man. And so he wrote all this to Bonhoeffer, and Bonhoeffer wrote back and said, you should not talk like that. Uh, of course you want to be with your wife and child, and you have every right to be. They need you. I need you. Um, but there is a danger, and he says, uh, there's the danger in every important love of our life. And then he says this. He says, God does indeed demand all our love but not in such a way that it blocks out all, all other loves. Instead, our love for God, which grows out of God's love for us, is the cantus firmus. Um, if you want to learn what the cantus firmus is, go listen to any good Bach cantata and listen for the main melody and then listen for the way the uh, other voices in the choir will pick up that melody and they'll just be interweaving um, in some delightful ways. That our love for God is the cantus firmus around which all our other themes of life, all the other motifs, form a counterpoint. Those are the other voices around the main melody. And uh, in that way, they enrich and strengthen those other loves, those other motifs. Strong, passionate love being one of them. As a matter of fact, he jokes with um, his friend, says, for a man to think about God when he's in the arms of his wife is really a very bad thing to do. Um, and he goes on and says, this is why polyphony is so important for us, because you can have the one without the other. The, 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 as long as the, as the cantus firmus, our love for God, is strong, all the other themes form a rich harmony. And he comes back to this idea in, in a couple of other letters, including among his fellow prisoners, that his prisoners are monophonic, that if they're scared, they're just scared. If they're hungry, and they get something to eat, that's all they think about. They can't hold the very many parts of life together in a rich whole. Uh, he says that's what life has to be. It has to be polyphonic. It has to hold together the joy and the sorrows, the fears and the loves. What I do uh, in the book is take this idea of the polyphony of life, which Bonhoeffer develops solely or pretty much in the, in the sense of a personal life through its joys and sorrows, its fears and its loves, and shows how they can harmonize together. 
what it seems to me that for the church in an era in which we no longer are in charge, if we ever really were, uh, it becomes a, a, a very helpful pattern for understanding the church's life in the world. To, and therefore, in our worship, in our teaching, in our raising children, uh, in our liturgies, um, we develop the cantus firmus, which is Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit among us. And then that gives us the basis then for our life and witness to the rest of the world. Uh, in music, uh, particularly as Western music has developed, it's very temporal. It moves along a very determinate and very decided, uh, timely unfolding. And it does so through tension. So that um, uh, whether it's dissonance, notes that just don't go together, or notes that are harmonizing but want something more, uh, and it's driven on in, in the, into the future. And therefore, a church that is firmly grounded in the cantus firmus, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the other voices of the world around us form a counterpoint. Now, sometimes those other voices are uh, harmonizing with our witness, uh, and we can cooperate with them. Uh, a beautiful example in the United States was the Civil Rights Movement, that the Civil Rights Movement and Christian witness harmonize. Okay? Um, matter of fact, the tension is more needs to be done. There is still yet more music to be heard. There is more justice to be had. At other times, these other themes that we encounter in the wider world are more dissonant. They are more in conflict with um, uh, our witness and the gospel, um, oftentimes in technological matters, the way we're organized, um, uh, the advancement of the uh, 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 technology to such an extent that we're harming our own climate, our own earth. Uh, and here Post, uh, Pope Francis's recent encyclical uh, is precisely to that point. At that point, we re, we, we're in, in a rejection of the, those ways, and so we have to do something very different. But again, it gives us a way of understanding our witness as it unfolds in time. Um, one other thing about music uh, that I've learned from some others is uh, to listen to music or to perform music, you can't set yourself apart from the music. You have to give yourself over to it. It has to shape the rhythms and your own self-understanding. If just for that amount of time um, that uh, you're performing it. Um, and again, one of the things that, in, particularly in Western music, it's always uh, moving towards that final cadence, that conclusion that drives the music forward. And that is also what the gospel is. Uh, Bonhoeffer says, the future has come into the present. And so we, we hear that conscious firmness, we hear that uh, theme from God and Jesus Christ, and we, that drives us forward, but always in hope, always in expectation. And yet, understanding there's still more music to perform, there's still more life, there's still more engagement with the world that is so very important. I've had many mentors, um, and uh, as one of my uh, friends and mentors says, uh, when you hear me, you're actually hearing them <laughs> as I'm uh, continuing the story, continuing the music. Um, certainly the teachers I've had along the way in seminary, at, uh, in graduate school at Duke, uh, people like Frederick Herzog, Stanley Harawas, who still remains a good friend, uh, friends in the Ecclesia Project, uh, William Cavanaugh, Michael Buddy, uh, people like this, they're, they're always um, uh, very much part and parcel of um, um, my background. If there's one person in addition to Bonhoeffer uh, 
So if Bonhoeffer's sitting on one shoulder, the one other person that's sitting on the other is a Catholic theologian. He's not really well known in this country, Herbert McCabe. Um, but he, uh, matter of fact, I use him a good bit in the book because I think in, in many ways he and Bonhoeffer are uh, working together uh, in terms of dealing with all these same questions. But I also uh, really like uh, Herbert McCabe because of his delightful sense of humor. Uh, those who are familiar with the story, he was an English Catholic Dominican. Um, and at the time, he was the editor of a very distinguished, and it's still a distinguished academic journal. And then one of the uh, leading Catholic theologians in England at the time came out and basically said, we should leave the church um, because it's corrupt. Well, McCabe came back and said, well, of course the church is corrupt. It's made up of human beings, but that's no reason to leave it. Well, his uh, superiors in the Dominican order were not amused. And so, as often happens to uh, Catholic um, uh, uh, religious, he was silenced for a time. And so he had to step down from being editor of this very distinguished journal. But eventually, it, it was decided, no, he basically didn't say anything wrong. That, in fact, the church is full of, full of ro rogues and scoundrels. But it's still uh, God's instrument. And so he was put back in charge of the journal, and in the very first editorial comment he makes, he starts out his little comment with saying, um, as I was saying before, I was so oddly interrupted. And I just, oh, that, that's a guy you got to pay attention to. I just love that. Um, uh, one final thing, and that is, as I told you, one of my mentors was uh, my doctoral advisor. His name was Fred Herzog. Um, and I noticed one day he had his Greek New Testament, and on each in the inside cover he had stamps he had collected from all over the world, but they were always of one type. They were a clowns. I asked him, Doctor Herzog, what, what's that about? And he says, it's just a reminder that while this is a very important book, not to take myself so seriously. And I said, that's a man I have to listen to. So that's those are the influences for me. Thank you.